Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to the Lunchtime Learning webcast of the Instructional Materials Coordinator Association of Texas, I'm Cat. I'm Tony Black from White House ISD and currently the president of IMCAT's Board of Directors. Today, IMCAT will be one of the leaders in new technology to make instructional materials more seamless for Texas schools. First, we want to thank our sponsor, Follette, for supporting our webcast and making it possible to offer this webcast for free. All right, you may have a lot of questions about interoperability. Today's webcast will give you the opportunity to ask questions. So you can call in today, you can text in, you can email in or even fax in your questions at any time. That's right, we don't want anyone to feel left out, so fire up those fax machines today and send us some questions. During today's broadcast, uh, we've got a super there on the screen that you can see, a graphic to let you know what those numbers are. You can text to 512-567. 0857. You can email at textbook at texas.net. You can phone in a question at 512-251-8101 or you can fax your question in to 512-251-8152. Do understand that normal uh, texting uh, message rates may apply. Well today we want to welcome to the studio Ann Booth from Houston ISD. Ann is a uh, former public school teacher, a former principal, curriculum and assessment director, and is currently managing the education technology department for the seventh largest school district in the nation, Houston ISD. So we want to welcome you this morning, Ann, or this afternoon, Ann. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Implementing a new teaching and learning platform that's dubbed The Hub, her team has integrated over a million learning objects into the repository and currently works with dozens of vendors to ensure smooth interoperability and single sign-on for all students and staff, eliminating the need for multiple usernames and passwords. Her latest work has been in partnership with the Texas Education Agency and IMS Global, digitizing the Texas standards, the TEKS, into a machine-readable format. So without further ado, we'd like to turn the presentation over today to Ann Booth. Uh, who will share with you this great information that she has. Thank you. You Thank bet. You, Tony. Uh, yes, I'm here to talk about the Machine Readable Teaks, for lack of a better uh, name. Uh, it's a project that we've been working on in conjunction with uh, about 12 other school districts in the state of Texas um, and the Texas Education Agency, as well as IMS Global. IMS Global is a, an organization that's a nonprofit, and it is um, composed of school districts, vendors, publishers, um, technologists, and uh, institutes of higher learning. And together they come together and they have created uh, open standards that uh, allow for the interoperability of uh, technology and for systems to communicate with each other. So uh, we'll start with uh, the TPAC model, the transition to personalized learning. Um, we start out with number one is uh, the content knowledge. And this is all building up kind of like a three-legged stool for personalized learning, which we're all targeting at this point in time. And so it starts out with the content knowledge, which is uh, composed of the TEKS, you know, uh, which incorporates into our STAR reporting categories. And of course, we have other standards, such as ELPS the, and the, con uh, the College and Career Readiness Standards. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second part of that stool would be uh, where the technology comes in and supports. That's through an LMS, and hopefully all of the listeners understand what an LMS is. It's a learning management system, which can be uh, a course management system that directs your courses. Students can submit assignments, um, as well as a learning object repository. Um, so when I say LMS throughout this presentation, that's what I'm referring to. And then also other, right, so other software. For clarification for people, we're talking about things like Blackboard. We're talking about things right. like uh, Canvas. Exactly. Some of those different Desire products. to learn. It's right. learning. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there, right? And then um, other forms of technology, which is like open educational resources and software, procured mm -hmm. software or free software that's out there that also helps support learning. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of that stool is is the pedagogy. Of course, that's where the rubber hits the road, and it's uh, about the instructional um, uh, skill of the teacher. And so anytime, anywhere, learning is also a part of that. That's also all supported. And of, of course, you know, the ultimate target is the personalized learning. So we have a problem in, 
uh, in Texas, or we did have a problem, and we had our learning standards that were published in a static format. So they weren't uh, interactive, and they were, you can see they were just on a, you know, an HTML page, but, or PD, printed in a, you know, a PDF format, and it was an outline format, um, but um, when people were trying to grab these and put them in a digitized state, they were uh, changing from vendor to vendor. Different people would interpret the teaks and code them in a different way. And so that was always causing problems for us. Versioning was also a, a problem. In this example, you see, you know, it was adopted at one point in time and amended to be affected at another time. So do we call this the 2012 standards or the 2013 version of the standards? You know, that was causing confusion um, between our systems. Um, this is uh, an example that's, that's out of our learning management system. We call it the hub in Houston. Um, and so in our hub, we had, you know, you look into our learning standards and under one set of standards, it's called 2.C, which is rounding decimals to tenths or hundredths. That exact same learning standard, if you pulled it up in a different place, it was 1.5.2.C. Exact same standard, but called two different things. Um, that was causing confusion. This is uh, more naming confusion here. Um, this is uh, our academic standards under academic benchmarks in the hub, under MA for math. Uh, this is solving linear equations. Um, on the bottom example there, you see it's under ALG because it's under the algebra curriculum, under secondary curriculum uh, department. They labeled it something completely different. And then under ed plan, which was our assessment system, they were calling it 111, which is under the chapter um, for the TEKS. So that's the, the exact same standard and it's called three different things in three different areas. So we had this problem of, of of communication because it was all labeled different things. This is under Academic Benchmarks as a third party vendor that we use to extract our TEKS in a digital format. And they were still keeping old versions of it. You'll see that uh, there's a current, more of a current mathematics TEKS and then the older mathematics TEKS. I said, why did you have the older ones on there? They said, well, we still have legacy systems that were developed using the old ones. So we still publish the old ones too. So that created confusion too. So the effect is, you know, um, content providers were always trying to uh, align and adjust when they were trying to, uh, when we were trying to ingest learning content, we were trying to align and realign. Uh, the versioning was very challenging and interoperability just breaks down uh, between all these systems that are trying to communicate uh, using different languages. So we decided that our purpose was going to be to talk to TEA and work with IMS Global to create a framework of uh, a language, a common language, if you will, for the publishing of the TEKS. And so TEA would be the one and only authoritative source uh, to gather those TEKS. So we didn't have to talk to Pearson and see how they managed to, to code the TEKS and McMillan and McGraw-Hill and Houghton Mifflin and you know all the different vendors. They would all go straight to TEA's portal. TEA would publish uh, one format in one language for the learning standards um, and so we worked on that. We started that uh, two and a half years ago and so what's happened since then we have uh, TEA agreed, they put it in their budget, they contracted with a company called TEG, uh, Trinity Education Group, and they uh, created a machine readable version of the TEKS according to this new standard and the new standard is called CASE. Competencies and Academic Standards Exchange. That's what IMS Global decided to call it. And so when you hear about CASE or the CASE TEKS, that's what that is. It's conforming to this universal standard. And actually, the CASE uh, format is, is, we're trying to spread it to the rest of the United States and uh, in, or, in abroad as well uh, for all learning standards. So even Common Core and everything else is gonna be trying, we're gonna be trying to uh, uh, align all of those to this new format so machines can talk to one another. Okay, so uh, this is just a visual representation of what it might uh, look like, and this is a simpler version of it, but uh, you start with the lower uh, corner there in curriculum. If we have all of our curriculum learning objects, learning items, and a learning object could be as simple as just a video or a lesson, um, 
if we have it meta tagged to that common standard, that curriculum now uh, feeds into our data warehouse as well as the assessments information feeding into the data warehouse. And from that, we have that information about student performance that we can also send off to a cloud decision tool. Now that cloud decision tool might be in a learning management system or it may be another third party, but either way, that cloud decision tool uh, could automatically recommend content for that student based on their learning needs. So this is just another way of looking at it, uh, personalized learning. And you know, I don't want to get you too caught up in graphics because sometimes people graphic you to death and it's just, it's too complicated and it's hard to look at. But if you just focus on this one, the, look at the first circle is curriculum. That curriculum obviously um, is taught and uh, a decision can be made at the end of that, dis at the en end of that lesson. Um, it can also go to the assessment and that assessment information feeds back to that decision. And if they have not mastered it, obviously it cycles back to recommend different curriculum, but based on the same TEEK, right? Or the TEEKs. Um, and this is what it might look like in a larger school district such as ours. We have several different assessments, assessment providers, several different curriculum providers. Um, we have a data warehouse that houses the, that information. And all of that can be contained within an LMS or it can be um, separate it out, but either way, that's it all feeds into that cloud decision tool um, that can recommend content. And that can still be done manually. You know, we can still do it the old fashioned way where uh, we look at the student performance data and we hand select content for students for remediation purposes. But uh, if we can automate that, it saves, obviously saves teachers a lot of time and energy. Right. So what's happened since then? Um, just recently, we've been very excited because we have Proclamation 2020 coming out and the State Board of Education decided that these new standards and these new uh, machine readable TEKS are gonna be part of the proclamation, the expectations. So I've listed here in the presentation, uh, this first URL uh, is just the TEA announcement specifying what that means for publishers. Um, the second bullet is the publisher's portal. Um, and uh, obviously, if you want to look at Proclamation 2020 in more detail, it's all listed there. But specifically on page 10, it says digital products now must be designed to use the machine readable TEKS provided by TEA. That is our expectation for all of our vendors that are providing digital products from now on. And then the third bullet is just, is just my recommendation that districts, when you uh, begin this process this fall, um, make some sort of announcement with your publishers at the beginning of the year by having a publisher's orientation or sending a formal letter to the publishers on behalf of your school district and just reinforce this, that this is an expectation. We expect you to conform that your digital products will be meta tagged with uh, these new machine readable TEKS. So the case teaks are now available. If you want to have a little peek at them, I provided this for you. There's the link right there. Um, and that's just a screenshot of the welcome page there. Um, and you can download the CSV files, which are kind of human readable, mm -hmm. uh, or, access, or access the APIs, which are the machine readable parts of it. There's also a part that shows uh, off to the right on that screenshot, you can see there's examples and tutorials that'll explain a little bit more about the case format and um, how these uh, can be used. When you go to that website, it will ask you to create a little account. So you will have to put in your email address uh, and, and register, but then you can download, download that information. And then um, this is just a quick little screenshot of how they look. Um, and I don't wanna go too deep into this because it's, 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 it's a lot more technical than we need to get at, at our levels, but I uh, just wanted to show you that the, the top uh, screenshot is just uh, what the identifier looks like. It's just a code. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and so right next to that is the full statement. So that's the human readable part of it, obviously, uh, where it has the subchapter and the, the SE. It, it explains it at the SE level, uh, what the number, the letters and the numbers exactly will be. Um, and then what strand and what, Eng what language it's under, it's under English obviously, um, and the versioning, it would be over there uh, where the change date is. Um, the second one is more about showing the associations. So it has the URL or the URI, which is the, basically where it points to that specific learning standard digitally and um, where it can be found. And then the associations, you'll see at the very tail end, it says child of, um, that's just showing the associations of the strands and the, the teaks with each, with each other. For instance, when you're talking about the 
uh, rounding to the nearest tenths or hundredths, the example we used earlier, you know, you would also want to teach place value. Before, right. before they can round numbers, they obviously need to understand place value. So they want to show those associations, and so that's how that, yeah. that format is set up. So that's, that's a quick pick, a quick peek at uh, what they look like. Um, are there any questions at this time? We haven't had any come in uh, live yet, but we do have a few questions that were sent to us previously uh, before we went on the air uh, in the last day or so. Okay. And so we want to make sure uh, that we cover those and that maybe give some of our viewers a chance to uh, go ahead and send in your uh, questions. We want to give you that uh, graphic again one more time, those numbers. Uh, so that you can either call or text in your uh, questions. Text those to 512-567-0857. You can email them to textbook at texas.net. You can phone us uh, at 512-251-8101 or you can even fax your question at 512-251-8152. So if you have questions that have come to your mind, while Dr. Booth was talking, please uh, send those uh, right away. One of the questions, and uh, yesterday we had the pleasure of, of visiting and sitting down with some folks from TEA, and actually I think we got to the bottom of this question, but it's a question that was asked and we want to make sure we answer it. Is an LMS an allowable uh, technology and instructional material uh, allotment uh, expense? Is it an allowable expense? Um, and so if yes, which d disbursement, a technology service, or an instructional material. Um, to the last half of that question, I believe um, it, it would. It, would it believe? Would you believe it would be a, a service or an instructional material? I would think it would be more of a service. I, I I would agree with you there. Okay. And so, and as always, TEA is always helpful to interpret that for you. And if if they feel like you've put that in the wrong category, then they can do it. But that is allowable if you um, calculate the percentage of the LMS uh, that is going to be used directly for instruction. Uh, so that was the answer we received from TEA. So, so it is allowable to purchase an LMS uh, from your TEMA uh, monies, uh, but make sure that you're doing that in a, in a percentage of those items that would directly affect or impact instruction. It, it won't pay for the entire uh, package because some of it is just administrative in nature. Um, Question came in, Dr. Booth, not every pu publisher offers common cartridges or TCC, but the publishers that are offering either charge extra for LTI, TCC, common cartridges, while some are not charging. Uh, so uh, you, have, you have any comment or anything directed oh, toward that? Okay. Yes, I, they should not be charging upfront costs for that. Uh, for Houston ISD, we were, uh, we were oftentimes the first people that, it, that were approaching the, the publishers about developing a common cartridge or a thin common cartridge mm -hmm. um, or you know at the very least provide LTI links to their platform um, or, or some kind of uh, some kind of authentication and uh, way that we could ingest it in the learning content and, and have uh, have it be capable of federated search within our learning object repository. And so um, we, we tried to negotiate right up front. But what I also recommend is that when, you know, we're the big kid on the block uh, in Texas. And so mm -hmm. in Houston, we're able to have a little bit of negotiating power. Um, so we've done some of that work for you. And believe me, we believe that uh, it's our responsibility to help set that precedent so that when, you know, smaller school districts go to the publishers, um, then that expectation is already there. And uh, if they've already developed a thin common cartridge or they've already developed a common cartridge, a lot of times all they need to do is, is change the key in secret and there's um, minimal work involved for them to provide that same content for you. So if they haven't charged Houston ISD, which they have not, um, they should not be charging smaller school districts for that. Um, what, I, what I was recommending earlier about having a publisher's orientation at the beginning of the school year is a really good idea because you set that expectation up front, either right. that or at the very right. least send a letter to those publishers on behalf of the district saying this is our expectation that it will have these case standards or we expect a thin common cartridge or whatever. <coughs> I will tell you that we've uh, worked with dozens and dozens of vendors. A lot of the big publishers are going to be able to provide thin common cartridge. 
um, for your learning management system. Um, but those smaller mom and pop shop kind of vendors uh, are not. Um, so, you know, we we work with them where they are. And sometimes, uh, in the case especially with our CTE adoptions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we had a lot of smaller vendors that just taught. You know, they're right. they're it just covered one course or two courses. Right. They they didn't have a lot of technology or a lot of staff to develop these common cartridges. So sometimes, at the very least, you know, we had static PDFs on a disk. You know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, we. We, we just ingested it within the, the courses, um, in the course library uh, in the LMS. So you have to work with different vendors. Uh, you can set your expectations high um, and find out what they have, um, and then when it comes down to it, you'll have to, you'll have to work with them based on what they have. Here's a question that maybe uh, attaches to that just a little bit. Uh, this question was, we have historically offered course packs that are specific to a learning management system. They wanted to know how are course packs and common cartridges related. Well, we, you know, we work with uh, our hub is built from its learning, and we did not have proprietary course packs. I realized that some learning management systems do. We have uh, kind of steered away from that. We like keeping our content separate from our LMS. Yeah. Um, part of that is is simply because. That's the same reason we call it the hub. We don't call it It's Learning, the vendor name, because if It's Learning does not meet our expectations, we we will sever that relationship mm -hmm. and we will find a different learning management system. So it's always important to keep your content and your learning management right. system separate so that if you do have to... Uh, part ways. Part ways <laughs> with a particular <laughs> vendor, then you move down to choice number two right. or choice number three. And so when we do our adoptions, we do it the same way. Our curriculum side, our teacher... Uh, committees and everything they do the selections and they always select a first choice second choice and a third choice when they're when we're doing adoptions right. and so then it comes over to the educational technology side and we look at it from the technology standpoint in our business specs and we we try to use their number one choice but if the vendor is not willing to cooperate with us and our technical expectations right. we will move to number two or number three or whatever and so competition is a great thing uh, right. you know right. and so it, it it helps them to meet our expectations right. uh, along the lines of what you were just talking about with keeping your content separate this question says what parameters should a district be fo focused on if they're looking to implement a learning management system. So I guess that would be one thing you want to do is con uh, consider keeping your content separate. But what are some things that districts should be looking for if they're wanting to implement a learning management system? Well, we uh, we did a whole RFP process when we were uh, developing our expectations, and it took months. And we. Uh, took people from a lot of different departments to talk about it because we needed to talk about the technical specifications but we needed to talk to curriculum and talk about you know what are your curriculum expectations uh, what kind of dynamic content do you want uh, or what can you live with and so we had to make a whole list of expectations if anybody really wants uh, me to share that it's a multi multi page document okay. that had all of our specifications that we wanted for our LMS and so if you want that uh, please email me or or contact MCAT and and we can uh, I'm Cat I'm Cat sorry right. and uh, I'll I'll be sure to share that with you. But uh, the main thing is when you look at an LMS, we're not just looking for a, we're not looking for a content provider. Some of the LMSs out there are just content providers. They're just a repository of their own proprietary content. Right. We want something that we can ingest from lots of different publishers. Right. so that we can do searches and we can gather uh, the information we need at one spot, one stop shopping. Mm -hmm. And so we want a learning object repository, but we also want a real dynamic course management system. Mm -hmm. So you want something that, that contains both of those entities together. And if you want more details, uh, contact us and, and I'll definitely send it out to you. Great, great. Excellent. Um, I'm looking here at some of these questions. I think we have covered most of them. Uh, and so I don't want to uh, go back over. Okay, I, there is one there yep. that says there's a what's the difference between a common cartridge and thin common cartridge? Okay. I, I don't know how much uh, your your members deal with that, but it's mm -hmm. something to to know about for the future. And that is the, the common cartridge. The the old way is to just package the content digitally, um, and then you just you just put it on to you load it into a any kind of drive server or you know. Uh, repository. Mm -hmm. um, the thin common cartridge 
the reason it's called thin is because it is uh, a directory of links. So these links are authentication links mm -hmm. that'll take you directly to their content. So instead of you loading the full content, the common cartridge, the full content, um, you link out to their content. Mm -hmm. And it's great because when they want to do an update, a system update, right. you're not having to update all of your content. Right. The links stay the same the updates are done on their side. You, your links stay the same within your learning management system. So when they click on the link, it still takes you to their, their cloud services, their repository where they're doing their, their updates so it doesn't mess with your system. So thin common cartridge is a lot easier, um, a lot easier, a lot easier to ingest and it's a smaller package. Great, all right. Uh, any, any other of those questions, anything about professional development for teachers? Um, that you would recommend for CNI specialists, for students and parents that? Uh, well, one thing I think that helped our teachers is we, we, we always bring in teachers to help build our content. We have a full curriculum department, but we also bring in teachers all the time because they're in the trenches and they can come in and give us the latest and greatest things right. oftentimes. Um, but we created master courses within our LMS. So uh, we have master courses for um, uh, each content area, and these are updated every single year. Um, and so teachers can can look there. They can find uh, exemplar lessons. They can uh, link immediately to content that's readily available in their library, in their courses. Um, and so it's either it's either built into their courses or uh, it's in the, the uh, LMS library, so they can do searches for it and then bring it into their course. Um, it's, it's done different ways depending on the course. We even have our fine arts, uh, our art classes, our music content, mm -hmm. all of that is ingested within our learning management system. So we even have music courses that are within our learning management system and so teachers can choose to, to do that or not. And then it's auto-populated with the students from our SIS, from our student information system. Great, great. Um, any, any final thoughts that you can think of that you'd want to uh try to leave people with as they're contemplating this well, huge conversation? I think the main thing is, is please uh, don't feel afraid to push back when vendors want to charge you extra for building common cartridges and for packaging their, their content for you. Um, it's now, uh, in Proclamation 2020, it's now an expectation. Um, interoperability is common now uh, or it's becoming more common and it's 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 simply an expectation that the school districts need to go forward with and please don't let them charge you extra if you have problems with that uh, you know feel free to contact me and we we have some some tricks up our sleeve and or some people that we can maybe uh, put you in touch with that can help uh, advocate for you at that level because they shouldn't be charging you extra for building uh, building interoperability standards into their digital content so thank you. Dr. Booth, we want to thank you so much for being with us today and thank sharing you. your uh, knowledge with us about the interoperability question and, uh, and the machine uh, language. That's great. And, and so we thank you for all your, your work in helping to streamline this process for all of us. We really do appreciate that. Uh, a reminder to all of you that uh, we need to uh, be looking toward the summer and uh, information will be hitting the IMCAT website soon at IMCAT.org uh, in relation to summer institutes. So if you're a uh, new uh, coordinator or you're, you've been around for a while, uh, but you want some uh, refreshers or you just want to get together with some folks who do the job that you do every single day, uh, come to one of the summer institutes. We have them at a multitude of uh, uh, places around the state, mostly at your regional service centers, but there are some other locations that are uh, at some school districts, et cetera. So uh, make yourself available to that. And so look at the IMCAT.org website coming up just in the next few days and see that full schedule of summer institutes that will be available in your area. You don't have to go to the one that's nearest you if that doesn't work as far as the date and time and location of that. And you're, you're welcome to attend any or, or all of them if you'd like to uh, just to get as much information uh, as you can. Uh, so, so check that out. Uh, those will be coming up. We also want to uh, make you aware of a couple of things. First of all, I have not checked. I apologize that I did not check, that, check this this morning, but uh, EMAT uh, should have opened back up today. If it has not done that, it should uh, happen uh, before day's end. So keep checking the EMAT system and see if that's opened back up for you to begin doing some ordering for the summer uh, for this next year. Uh, and uh, we thank TEA for their hard work in getting that uh, back up and running so quickly with all of the different 
um, elements that they had to push into that system. One uh, new piece of information related to that, uh, the EMAT system is going to be moving away from the TEAS login system to the TEAL login system, T-E-A-L. So if you do not have TEAL credentials, uh, you need to begin working on that because at the end of May, uh, there will be another short brief closure just over the weekend to do some updates around the Memorial Day weekend uh, that uh, will transition the platform from Tees to Teal. If you have a Tees account, then you need to register for a Teal account and those things will sync together. If you do not do that by that time, that's going to create some problems for you and you could have to go in and kind of create, do the process all over as far as registering for an account to be able to access your email, uh, your EMAT information. So take the time to uh, pay attention to that and look into uh, the TEAL uh, credentials that you need to get. And we'll be posting something on uh, the IMCAT.org website as well to help you and assist you in doing, uh, going through that process. And be looking to in your email inbox uh, for information from TEA uh, on that very topic as well. Once again, we want to thank uh, Dr. Booth for being here today and spending time with us to talk about this uh, huge subject uh, of, of trying to make technology more accessible to all of us as it relates to textbooks. Uh, remember our IMCAT annual conference will be coming up before too long and uh, that's going to happen in November this year. So just remember the date has changed uh, from what is traditionally uh, our IMCAT time in December. So uh, November 10th through the 14th at Galveston this year. So make sure you make uh, arrangements to be a part of uh, that pro uh, process. And I did just get confirmation, thank you Kelly, uh, that uh, EMAT is open. So uh, if you haven't checked that out today, you can go out and uh, take care of your EMAT business today. So once again, we thank you so much for joining us today uh, here. Thank you for your support of IMCAT. Uh, and uh, we ask you to check out the website frequently for new information, both print and electronic information will be coming to you and the website for future webcasts and other training opportunities. So from the IMCAT studio today, I'm Tony Black. Thank you for being with us.